Well, lawmakers in Montpelier returned home last weekend, but their work is not over. Roughly 60 bills cleared the House and Senate in the closing days and will soon be on the governor's desk. He made it clear this week he will not accept a number of them. And that will trigger a veto override session in June, the legislature coming back on the 20th. There are a number of bills I have concerns with. And again, um, we'll look at, uh, take a look at all those and put them together and I'll have to prioritize as well. I can't veto everything. Um, so I'll just have to make some decisions over the next couple of weeks. In the crosshairs, the $8.5 billion state budget, the only really must pass bill. Scott says it focuses on a lot of good things, but spends far too much. We'll hear this morning from all three parties. First, Phil Scott lays out his cards in an effort to negotiate a deal. I've been clear. I'm ready and willing to work with legislators to find the right balance between their approach and mine, because that's what Vermont has elected us to do. As I said in my adjournment address, majority of Vermonters voted for me in the last election in every single town, uh, while also electing them. Vermont has voted for balance and expected us to work together. But they've also been loud and clear with me that they didn't think Vermont was affordable even before this legislative session. That's why I have serious concerns about the financial impacts of what they passed. Between a $100 million payroll tax, $20 million in DMV fees, $30 million in property tax pressure, at least $180 million in potential clean heat mandates, that works out to roughly $1,200 per household per year. I worry about everyday Vermonters already facing cost increases due to inflation. I worry about lower income single moms who won't significantly benefit from what was passed this year, but will pay more in taxes and fees to help families with higher incomes. Or the seniors on fixed incomes who are already living on the edge and won't see any benefits but will face higher costs. Now it's no secret I have some disagreement with the approach lawmakers have taken. So I'll once again make this appeal, what you and the press are now familiar with. We share the same goals. We both support making historic investments in shared priorities. But I believe we must do it in a way Vermonters can afford. We have five weeks between now and when they come back at the end of June. Vermonters want us to work together, and I'm ready to do just that. On the final day of the session, 17 Democrats and progressives voted against the new state budget. It still passed, but that would not be enough to override a governor's veto. That group said no because the budget, they say, lacks sufficient funding to transition thousands now living in taxpayer-funded motel rooms who will soon be out on the street. One of the 17 rebels is Representative Taylor Small. It was a tough vote. I think we all very much struggled with how to address the homelessness crisis, especially after three years of federal uh, funding support to be able to keep folks in housing. And where I think we really kind of lost our, our ground on this one was following in the governor's footsteps and the path that he laid before us and really exiting 3,000 people from this program rather than finding a just and humane tr transition out of the motels and into more long-term stable housing or at least uh, more permanent shelters. Well, but it's a very expensive proposition to keep that many people in $150 a night motel rooms at taxpayer expense, no? Well, I would say in an eight and a half billion dollar budget, this would only be about 0.3% of that budget overall. And we weren't looking to fund the program fully through the entire year, but more again, finding that off ramp to the program, that there are some folks who, yes, will be able to find additional housing options, but for a majority of those folks, we're talking about people with complex health needs, uh, physical and mental health disabilities, and even folks fleeing domestic and sexual violence. And so I think if we're gonna be be, uh, exiting folks from that program, we should be finding a more just transition to another housing program. You're coming back third week of June, uh, most likely to consider a veto override of the budget. Will the 17 who voted no stick together? 
You know, we are still very much in discussion. There is hope that with the administration listening along to our debates um, and further conversations with the Agency of Human Services, that this might not be the end of the line, that we might be able to move around funds that are already appropriated in this budget to be able to find that just transition. But if those conversations do not come to a point where we can feel comfortable and live with our conscious knowing that folks would be put out onto the street, um, I do believe that we would hold firm and uh, sustaining the governor's uh, expected veto. Which would really force the issue with 10 days left before the new budget kicks in. It absolutely would and would show that this is a, an extreme concern of our legislative body, that it has to be addressed now um, instead of having to deal with the repercussions after the fact. Representative Taylor Small. For the House and Senate Democratic leaders, that group of 17 is now a wild card in their negotiations with Governor Scott. The Senate leader joins us this morning. Senator Phil Baruth, the president pro tem, welcome back to NBC5 In Depth. Thanks, Stuart. So it's over, but it's not over. Exactly, we have a veto session June 20th through the 22nd, and that will determine the fate of a lot of these issues. So three days, is it gonna take three days? You know, unfortunately, if we don't get rule suspensions, it might take four, in other words, if we send the House things overrides on the first day, it needs to travel for a couple of days. So it might be that we need to go past midnight on that third day to get where we need to be. You're anticipating uh, a stack of vetoes. Well, I, I would say the governor has made noises about at least five bills that I can think of. Um, there may be others. Tell so, me what's on your list. Well, so uh, H-230, which was the gun bill with the 72-hour waiting period. He's talked about vetoing the budget. Um, he's talked about vetoing child care, uh, universal school meals. Those are the four that I really think are most likely. The beverage deposit? Absolutely. Expansion. The bottle bill. Yeah, bottle bill. Uh, let's talk about the budget. Mm -hmm. On the last day of the session, uh, there was what only semi-seriously has been described as a mutiny, uh, 17 Democrats and progressives in the House who voted against the Democratic budget. Right. Uh, that could spell trouble for a veto override. Does that concern you? It does, uh, as does the end of the motel program itself. That concerns me too. What I would say there and what I would want people to understand is that for the last three years, we've been pouring money into the housing sector trying to bring units online, trying to provide uh, permanent affordable housing. That's about a half a billion dollars over the last three years. Then in terms of temporary housing, including the motel program, that was about another half a billion dollars of federal money. That program, the motel program, was always going to end in the way that FEMA programs, their emergency programs, they come in, they help, they provide shelter, and then they go away. Um, that program is destined to end. It was always going to happen on this watch, the way the beginning of the pandemic happened on my friend Tim Ash's watch. So uh, we have been engaged for the last six months trying to make sure the level of funding we're providing as we end that program is adequate. And at this point, we've got about $50 million in emergency funds out there. We think that's adequate but the administration will be administering that tail off of the motel program. So we'll be out of session, but we will be watching and we will be providing oversight. The administration said this week they don't really know exactly how many uh, of those who will be exiting the motel rooms do not have any other place right. to go. It's sort of a, a, a the figure moves around. But yeah. I mean, is this a, an unfolding humanitarian crisis where you know, there are communities in central Vermont that are, are, are bracing themselves sure. for what's and, coming. And, and I think everyone is right to brace themselves. So prior to the pandemic, we had uh, a problem with people experiencing homelessness. I know in Burlington we did. And then during the pandemic, we got FEMA money. It was called non-congregate housing funds. And the desire was to have uh, people be in lockdown individually without spreading the virus in congregate settings. So that temporary money was for that reason, and it was always going to have to end. Um, what I would like to think is that between the 
uh, money that we had queued up prior to the budget, then what went into the budget, and then we added 10 million more in the budget conference. The funding should be adequate. Uh, it's just a question of is the Agency of Human Services prepared in the way that they testified to us that they were. So is there room for negotiation, uh, some sort of an addendum to this budget to modify it that would either be acceptable to um, some of those Democrats and progressives or perhaps some Republicans who didn't vote for the budget either, as the governor suggested? Well, if I've learned one thing in this life over the last dozen years in office, you don't negotiate against yourself. So I'm still very hopeful that the governor will sign the budget. It's a very good budget. Uh, it had 29 votes in the Senate, and um, I'm hopeful that the governor will see his way clear to letting it become law. The child care um, expansion is historic. Uh, yes. It was uh, essentially the Senate's position carried the day. The House wanted paid family and medical leave, and uh, you said no. There is not the even majority support in the Senate to advance it this year. Does that mean, is there a, an agreement with uh, the Speaker to bring this up next year? Is the Senate no. going to look any more favorably on it? No, there's no agreement uh, in terms of next year. What we did say, we have H-66, which is their version of paid family leave, on the wall in economic development. Um, I said, as we always do, that next year will be a brand new slate and we'll take a fresh look at it. Right now, the votes are not there, as you mentioned, in the Senate. With that said, Let's Grow Kids ran a fantastically successful campaign to bring people on board for childcare. The advocates for paid family leave want to do the same sort of thing. And if they change minds in the Senate and we caucus in January and it looks like that's a high priority, then we'll view it differently. But uh, there's no agreement to do this, that, or the other with that bill. Ahead, inside the negotiations to override the governor on the year's most contentious legislation, the climate bill known as S-5. It came down to a single vote. But Ruth explains what happened. Back now with more from Senate President Pro Tem Phil Baruth on the closing days of the Vermont State House session and what's coming next. Can you uh, take us inside the, the High Wire Act that was the veto override of Senate Bill 5, the Clean Heat Standard, the Affordable sure. Heat Act? Uh, it, the governor talks about how you, that, that showed that you can override him, um, the Democrat supermajority. Um, you were right on on the, the knife's edge there. Yeah. You had exactly the, the minimum number to override. Senator Sears of Bennington was the pivotal vote. <laughs> That's right, my friend, Senator Sears. I'll always love him for that vote. Um, what I will say is that it was a very difficult decision for Senator Sears, and we were in constant communication with him. He's a very thoughtful lawmaker, and I think he was satisfied at the end of the day with what we call the check back. So nothing of any substance is going to happen until the legislature passes another bill that has the particulars about S5 and climate change and our response. And then at that point, we will have another discussion, another vote. The governor will have another chance to veto, if he so wills, and then we'll have to override again. So I think that was enough of a, of a, you know, a, a safety check that Senator Sears and others who were on the fence could stay with us. I just want to mention one thing. That sort of result doesn't happen magically. My vote counting team, my leadership team, Senator Clarkson, Senator Perchlick, and Senator White, uh, they did fantastic work. And we had 20 votes going into it. We knew all along where everybody was. We were making calls to firm up people that were a little uh, wobbly, and I, I credit them greatly for that result. Did you, uh, did you tell your friend, Senator Sears, uh, what would happen if you voted the other way? <laughs> no, no we, have a, we have a much closer and better relationship than that. 
Um, he told me what his concerns were. We went to Ledge Council and they drafted a couple of memos pointing out that um, some of his concerns uh, didn't seem to be serious impediments and that was enough for him. In his, uh, at his press briefing this week, Governor Scott um, sort of ran through sort of a, a back of the napkin tally of the added spending and taxes and fees that the Democratic supermajority, as he likes uh, to call you, um, push through in your mm -hmm. budget and revenue bills. Uh, it's, a, it's a big number that he said could cost every household in Vermont 1,200 new dollars per year against uh, a cost of living that is already among the highest in the nation. What do you say to that? Well, I, I saw the breakdown before we started, and um, in that he includes, I believe, $180 million as the result of S5, the climate change bill. That is completely and utterly fictitious. Nobody knows what those costs are going to be. It's based on a number that Julie Moore, uh, Secretary of Agency of Natural Resources, uh, said was a back of the napkin number that she didn't really stand behind. So, you know, Governor Scott is, I think, at, at a point where um, he's doing his best to characterize whatever we do as breaking the bank. And I just don't believe that's true. So if you take, for instance, the child care bill, uh, Phil Scott has said since he got into office that he really wanted to do something substantial for child care. And that's allowed him a talking point for all those years. But he never wants to come up with the actual courage, which he talks about a lot. He, he exhorts us to have courage. But he has never had the courage to raise the resources that are necessary to transform that sector. So if you want to supercharge the economy and bring those parents back into the workforce, if you want to end the childcare deserts that we've been experiencing, you need a transformative infusion of resources. And the governor's not willing to do that. Uh, Democrats and progressives have indicated that we are, and every two years, voters have elected more of us so that we're in a position to do that. He points out he won every single town in Vermont and tallied 71% of the vote. I mean, and his party lost seats, as they have every election going back however many won it. So suggesting that Vermonters do want the two sides to compromise? That's one way to look at it. I think the cautionary tale for the governor is no matter how popular you are, you can't get away with blocking popular initiatives. So we have another month, a little over a month before the legislature comes back. I just want to circle back. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, conversations between leadership and the administration that will unfold? Uh, will there be some kind of negotiation that I don't, will uh, until, take place out of public view? Yeah, I, I guess um, until there's a veto. So the governor often says, until the legislation hits my desk, I'm not gonna review it or take a position. And I think we have the mirror position. Until he's vetoed something, we're very confident in what we produced. Uh, Jane Kitchell from Caledonia produced a balanced budget, as she always does, that's crisp, efficient, and yet accomplishes so much for Vermonters. So that being said, I don't know why we would, prior to a veto, uh, negotiate in essence against ourselves. But we can expect there will be those conversations if there is a veto. If there is a veto, we obviously have to um, talk with everybody about everything. State uh, Senate President Pro Tem, Phil Baruth, thanks for your insights. Thanks, Stuart. Appreciate you coming in. Again, veto session in Montpelier June 20th to deal with an as yet undetermined number of bills. Scott expects to begin his review in the coming week. And then there is the exceptionally rare matter of impeachment. House Speaker Jill Krowinski this week appointed seven House members to begin the fact-finding probe into alleged misconduct by the Franklin County State's Attorney and the Franklin County Sheriff. If they recommend impeachment, the full House will reconvene to vote. And then the Senate would return to the Capitol and hold a trial, which we think might last a week for each of the two individuals. It's the only way to remove newly elected officials, something that has not happened in more than a century. John Grismore and John Lavoie continue to refuse multiple calls to resign. We'll be right back. <laughs> 